707. I'm Daedalus Howell. This is going to be a good one. We have Phyllis Rosenfield with us. She is the executive director of Listening for a Change. What is Listening for a Change for those who aren't familiar with it? Yeah, basically, Listening for a Change is a nonprofit, and um, we have a mission, but I think the best way to describe it is we're a community building organization that uses oral history, active listening, to bring people together for better understanding and connection, acceptance, um, so that uh, that's what we do. We do it through community programs and school programs, and sometimes we work with businesses and other groups, but primarily in the schools. And, and you use yeah. video to capture these histories so people can enrich themselves with others' experience and actually listen to them for once. Right, especially our school program. Um, the kids, t there's a curriculum on how to do oral histories mm -hmm. and it breaks things down into very small steps into, um, so that um, kids can learn body language, open-ended questions, safe to sensitive, tone of voice, follow-up questions. Um, things that not many adults are very good at, <laughs> right. to tell you the truth. And things that yeah. probably aren't being taught in school as part of the regular curriculum. No. And it really, these life skills are part of building a school community and our community at large where we have less intolerance and bullying and all the things that everybody's concerned about. And it helps students and community members feel more a part of the school community and the larger community which is a big issue now, and it has been for a long time, but it's starting to be recognized. Yeah. And this isn't the only way to do this, but it's an excellent way uh, for people to feel like, this is my community, I'm seen, I'm heard, I'm understood, and therefore I might do my math and my social studies and my science and writing right. and all the things that we're supposed to be doing in schools. And we bring, in the process, the kids um, usually pick a topic, for example, uh, we've been at Roseland University Prep for many years, and um, some of the classes have taught, uh, interviewed people around immigration, um, people who survived terrible diseases, LGBT community, uh, what is justice, etc., and uh, people in the military. Mm -hmm. um, the classes choose, and then each class interviews about four people. And from their community or from, from other? From the community, okay. from the community at large. So, so they the need to reach out and begin right, to interface. That's right. great. So they have to, kids get on the phone, they talk to people they know, they, you know, this is a big discussion uh, in and of itself. These aren't just life skills, they're job skills too. They're good job skills. In fact, we've had kids say to us, you know, all the things I learned in the interviewing class, I, I applied for a job at McDonald's and I was so proud of myself. I knew how to interview, I knew how to respond. Uh, so those are good life skills. So I watched your TEDx talk from mm -hmm. TEDx Sonoma mm -hmm. and uh, I loved how you open explaining that we don't really listen to each other mm -hmm. anymore. Uh, you described uh, uh, a dinner party scenario wherein the most charming, uh, sparkling personality usually sucks up all the air from the room mm -hmm. and all attention is directed that way. And conversations don't really occur so much as a, a monologue happens. Being that guy, usually, mm -hmm. sucking up all the air in the room, <laughs> I, <laughs> I had to turn off the talk and I didn't watch, watch the rest of it. What happens after? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, just kidding. But um, how do we begin to really listen to each other? We're so programmed, I think, or we've inherited a, a style of dialogue where it's difficult to not be thinking what you're going to say next or how you are going to be that clever, sparkling, charismatic personality. How do we listen? How do we learn to listen or relearn to listen? Well, the hegemonic culture says talking is what's important and being the most clever person dashing that hand up quickly and and having the right answer right I mean, that's and how we socially do. being very uh, amusing um, but I, I do think that um, one we think about what's involved um, and the classes that we do with adults as well as students uh, and I alluded to it a little earlier, is breaking it into small pieces, and we have exercises. Like nodding your head is a wonderful way to show that you're really listening, and really eye is. contact. Okay. And um, yeah. they're very simple, and people who know how to do it usually have learned from another family member or someone else. That's interesting. Or, but if you haven't learned it, a lot of times you don't have the skills. Well, let's, let's 
if you don't mind doing a little mm -hmm. bit of triage on me sure. right now. So, so I'm listening to you because I have to know what you're saying because mm -hmm. I need to respond to it mm -hmm. and not look like a total idiot <laughs> in this conversation, right? Mm -hmm. It's a job thing for me, but I'm, I'm, I'm obviously very interested. And you indicated that I'm using body language that shows that I am listening. Mm -hmm. What are, what are some, I mean, but that's, that doesn't mean I'm actually listening. I mean, I know I am, but are these tricks of people? I mean, it sounds like. It's not a trick. Good, okay, yeah. 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 I mean, we're looking for authentic uh, connection. Okay. And a big part of the authentic connection, for example, is open-ended questions. And um, of course, an open-ended question is something that you're not gonna answer with one or two words. Right. And, and also not leading someone else. We do that all the time. Wasn't that a great experience movie? That, so you're telling the person, I think it was a great movie, don't you agree with me? That's great. So you're not really asking. And you're framing them. In yeah, a, yeah but if you say, what did you think about that movie we just saw? That's a completely different question. And one of the examples that we use with, in our curriculum is, uh, wasn't it tough growing up in your poor Chicago neighborhood? Well, you're leading someone, you're making judgment, but if you just say, what was it like growing up in your Chicago neighborhood? Again, a completely different question. Right, and so, hopefully that yields a more open and authentic answer. Because mm -hmm. they could say yes or no, and that would be the end of yeah. that you know, uh, dialogue or um, sharing. The other thing that, um, and you're doing it now with me, is the follow-up questions, mm -hmm. that's really something we don't do. People will say, oh, how was your vacation? And you'll share a little bit, and they don't come in, oh, I'd love to know more about da 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 or tell, let's go back to when you were talking about this, can you tell me? We don't, we're not doing that with each other. And it doesn't mean that you always have to be a listener. In fact, I think with good friendships, you're gonna listen to me for a while, and I'm gonna really actively listen to you, and we seesaw and, and show our caring, but you're doing an oral history, then you're totally attentive to that person. You don't talk about yourself, even though me, you may have lived in Chicago <laughs> too. Oh, I want to, you, did you live in a, da, da, da. no, that's not where you do that. Right. And a lot of times, for example, people think they're being empathetic by saying, oh, I had something just like that happen <laughs> right. to me. And posing their own experience back into the right. equation. And it's bringing the attention back to themselves. I'm going to impose our producer on us right now. Uh, we're talking with Phyllis Rosenfield. Uh, she's the executive director of Listening for a Change. We'll be right back on 7 to 7. <laughs> Back on 7 to 7, I'm Daedalus Howell. We're talking to Phyllis Rosenfield of Listening for a Change. Uh, just to pick up where we left off, we're mm -hmm. talking about the notion of empathy in conversation and mm -hmm. how when uh, somebody says, yeah, yeah, I, I'm like that too, and they start imposing themselves back into the conversation and framing it through their ego, mm -hmm. that it can be disruptive and an authentic discourse might not be able to occur. How do we allay that tendency? How do we get our, out of our own way so we can actually communicate with each other? Well, one thing you start thinking about what that means, and um, I think so often we are bringing the attention back to ourselves over and over again. And Why do we do that? Well, I think people think that they need attention. <laughs> and Why do I do that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think that the dominant culture encourages it. If you watch television, and even some of the good, good interviewers will do that, you know. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, we're just we, we're just not that aware. I don't, as you said earlier, and I and we certainly agree that it, we're not taught how to be good listeners, and we don't know how to be good listeners. And and it's a skill. It's not anything that we just. And we have to. We are encouraged to broadcast ourselves on social media. We're encouraged to always have something to say and always be pushing aspects of ourselves into some kind of space, yeah. communal or otherwise. Right. But the idea is that we're we're always putting out versus rather or outputting versus in, you know ingesting other people's input. And very rarely on Facebook, for example, is a real conversation and dialogue. People want you to agree with what they've done or tell them how good it looks or how wonderful. I had a friend recently tell me that she didn't agree with someone, something somebody said mm -hmm. and wrote a comment accordingly on the Facebook page. And the person got very upset, and some of the other people. That's not what you're supposed to do in that circum. You know, it, there, it's not conversation. It really isn't. It isn't. Let's explore this. Let's think about it. Let me hear what you have to say. I'm really interested in what knowing about more who you are and how you think. And so we don't do that very much. 
Yeah, it's it's surface level. It's it's mm -hmm. cheerleading often, mm -hmm. and it doesn't amount to conversation. Right. If we remove, I mean, let me ask you this: it Is part of the goal of your organization to kind of remove this, these artificial barriers to communication, like Facebook, kind of get that out of the equation, so that people can literally see each other and, exactly. and can speak like that? And kind yeah. of, uh, we think, especially in 2016, that people are losing those skills. Young people aren't acquiring them, and it's easier and easier with texting and and Facebook types of activities, whatever you use, mm -hmm. um, to not connect. And thinking about what is involved, what is involved to really make these, because it's more important than ever. I mean, we're, we make assumptions uh, about yeah. some, how someone looks or acts, that this must be how they, who they are. And we've been getting ourselves in a lot of trouble. We get shot. <laughs> yes, I mean, crazy things shot. happen. Yeah, terrible things can happen both locally, nationally, and internationally. And yeah. it's all the same issue of really, do we understand each other and, and are we taking the time to understand so that we can make collaborative decisions? It's not always easy. It's, in fact, it's not easy. And, and it's yeah. ironic too, because we are connected. We are mm -hmm. hyper-connected, mm -hmm. and yet there's, there's no interpersonal connection mm -hmm. that, that where you, you share a space and you can actually communicate. Or when not I, enough. There is some, but it, that we need to do more is our contention. So. Do you think that online media, social media, has degraded the language a little bit? That we don't know how to use it anymore? Or, or people who are learning to understand language as a tool are misusing it because they don't even know how to spell? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> is that an old guy thing to say? Probably. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's the least of our worries. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so uh, one thing I know that my producer John was concerned about was the notion of eye contact and how sometimes that doesn't seem to be occurring with young people. Mm -hmm. is, is that just an observation that he's having or have you noticed this as well where, where kids are sort of, their, because this is their interface with the world now, they're not, they don't engage. Uh, yeah. And we've all literally seen people sitting across from each other texting back and forth rather than talking to each other and it's yeah. like, woo, that's really strange. But um, yeah, I think eye contact is part of it. And, yeah. and certainly, um, and we joke with the high school students, you know, these skills you just don't learn, it'll be good for your relationship with your girlfriends and right. your boyfriends <laughs> as well as your family and community because um, everybody wants to be, uh, feel like they're being seen. And, and part of that is, you know, the body language, the eye contact and the yeah. uh, demeanor and that we have with each other. I think more is transmitted through the eyes than through emojis. I could be wrong, but uh, I, I, would, I would hope, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. We're talking with Phyllis Rosenfield. Uh, she is with uh, Listening for a Change. When did you guys start the, uh, the program? Well, it's interesting. I think I talked a little bit, bit about it in, in that TEDx piece, but this began in the late 80s when there was uh, legislation in Sacramento to put people who had AIDS or uh, HIV positive in camps, which was very, oh very God. disturbing. Right, right? I that's real. About that. yeah. yeah, it didn't yeah. pass. But uh, there was uh, quite a bit of public conversation about it. Mm -hmm. And I went around pacing at my home and with my close friends saying, you know, how could we even, how could this be an option to consider? Mm -hmm. Are you from California? I grew up, actually you will be surprised because most people assume I'm East Coast and make that assumption, but I was actually born in Oklahoma and oh, okay. I grew up in the South, primarily in Tennessee, East Texas a little bit. Yeah, I can a tell from years. that accent. Yeah, a weird accent. <laughs> <laughs> but my father was from Oklahoma and my mother was from Brooklyn, so it's a really strange. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> um, but um, I think for me, um, knowing a lot of people who had escaped or survived the Holocaust as a child because we're Jewish, um, and also growing up in the South where it was very segregated when I was growing up. It right. wasn't until I was in high school that integration started to happen. Um, the theater in town had an upstairs for the blacks and the or downstairs for the whites. That was still around then, wow. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. So. The, yeah, the notion of quarantining people is crazy. Crazy. It is. It it's, was and I, I remember that was that. I do remember that now. That was an actual discussion. Yeah. And so that spurred you to. So that spurred um, me and another woman named Lisa Slater, who had done some oral histories when she was at um, Harvard, and I had done a lot of black and white photography. I had a social science, sociology, education, art background, real hodgepodge, and was doing a lot of uh, black and white photography at the time. 
Um, I wanted to take pictures who, of people who had survived dramatic losses of human rights, and she was going to interview them, which is what we did. And we interviewed not just Holocaust Shoah survivors, but Japanese Americans who were interned here uh, during World War II, as well as Cambodians who uh, were in camps during the Pol Pot regime. One of the things that they, all of these groups of people had in common was that um, they had told that they had to gather their belongings, whatever they could carry, and no more. And they were sent somewhere they didn't know where they were going. Right. And psychologically, it was pretty much the same for all three groups. Very different circumstances. One was auto-genocide, one was during the war, one was uh, strong anti-Semitism and other kinds of <coughs> prejudices. But um, one of the things that we got out of this as we interviewed people and took place, uh, photographs of them in their homes, and you can see this exhibit um, on our website now, it was originally at the Sonoma County Museum. Mm -hmm. We got a lot of good press from it, and we, at the time, started writing some curriculum uh, because the state was requiring, a man had a mandate to teach human rights and genocide, so I it see. fit into that. Um, but. Uh, Oh, one of the things we got out over and over again is that people who knew their neighbors, there was no guarantee, but people who knew their neighbors had a good chance that someone would give them a hand. Right. Uh, Irv Pietrakowski's father, Joe, in Petaluma was hidden by a neighbor in, in Poland uh, in, at great risk to the family because they knew him, you know, and property was saved in the West County by people who knew their Japanese American neighbors. So because they had become neighbors in ostensibly friends because they had communicated. Because they knew, he, yeah, they yeah. had communicated, right. they saw each other as human beings and not otherwise. Right. So a big part of what we're doing is trying to not otherize and let's, to break let's that pick down. Up, that's, yeah, let's pick up on that in the next segment here. Sure. We're talking with uh, Phyllis Rosenfield from Listening for a Change on 7 to 7. We'll be right back. <laughs> We're back on 707. I'm Daedalus Howell. I'm with Phyllis Rosenfield from Listening for a Change, local 501c3, that helps prevent otherizing. I don't know if that's actually yeah, a word. It's becoming <laughs> a word, actually. I've seen otherizing. it a few times, yes. Mm -hmm. um, but l let's talk about this phenomena of, mm -hmm. of seeing people as others and how that leads to dehumanization and all the things we mm -hmm. talked about in the last segment. How does communication uh, as a process bring an end to that, or at least prevent it? Well, I think what thirty words or less. <laughs> <laughs> Once you make a connection with someone who looks really different, has a very different background, who maybe you've never had a chance to speak with before, um, and you start seeing what not just the facade, the hair, the clothing, the accent, whatever it is, but that you share a great deal. You share and your ambitions, you share the love for family, you share different kinds of foods, whatever it is, or travel, but what you start getting in touch with is your common humanity. Right. And without that, we're doomed. I mean, when we see someone, uh, those, uh, you know, all Muslims are blah, 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 mm -hmm. then we're in trouble, you know, and all. So as long as we have these stereotypes and can't see who we are and come to understanding, then we're, then we're in serious trouble. But in practice, I mean, how, how do you engage somebody that's different than you, um, starting from zero? Well, one of the things we've done is, this is a formal experience to do an oral history. And for example, we were, and we did the oral history stories for art and storytelling at the Sonoma County Museum recently. Mm -hmm. And they did body maps, and there were people from all over the community and uh, we help the interview in, in whatever language that they wanted to speak in. And that's another thing. If you go, look, go to our website and see the interviews that the kids have done, we've translated everything into Spanish or English because those are the two languages. This is listeningforachange.org. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but uh, there's a ways, and, and it's crossing boundaries, uh, being respectful, um, but most people will agree to be interviewed because you're honoring them. Mm -hmm. And most people have, everyone, our contention is that everyone has a story. And um, we create 
connections one story at a time. That's our little tagline. Yeah, it's a great one. Yeah, so um, thank you. But that's that's what you guys can do. But everybody <laughs> can do that. I mean, you're suggesting. I mean, let me let me back up here. You think? Do you think? It's, it's, would you recommend rather mm -hmm. uh, somebody saying, I am different than this person, but I want to create a dialogue and override my own BS, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and preconceived, preconceived notions and stuff. Hi, my name is so-and-so. Can I talk to you a little bit about you? You don't even have to be that formal. I mean, okay. I think change it up and start asking, you know, being respectful and asking people questions. You know, tell me about where you're from, you know, or a bit, but being really, kind. Like being human. And being not, human. Yeah. But you can do it in all kinds of circumstances. It's amazing that sometimes, what do we do something with Oliver's, I think. and The grocery store mm -hmm. chain. Yeah. yeah. And in a few minutes we did some demonstrations. People who had been working together for years didn't know, oh, I didn't know that about you. That's amazing. Wow. Da, da, da. And you're talking three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> After so, third, three years, perhaps, of working side by side. Exactly. Yeah. And that happens all the time. Yeah. So sometimes a person is right next door to you in the cubby, in the office, in, in literally in your neighborhood or your wherever you go to shop or whatever it is. You know, we can start doing better. And, and some of it is just common friendliness. How is it going? And it's amazing what people, if we put ourselves out there. Some of it is fear-based. We're so afraid of everyone else that we've this kind of behavior is dropped as well. And a lot of the fear is unfounded, I think. How do you muster the energy to maintain this, this space that you operate within? I, I, I have crippling social anxiety and I don't want to deal with people half the time, mm -hmm. right? And I have to motivate myself to, to engage at all, half, mm -hmm. half, given any day. Mm -hmm. how, how do you override those, I'm, I'm not sure if you feel like that, but how do you, how do you override that, that sensation and, and make yourself engage? Well, I'm not a super extrovert, but I'm somewhat of an extrovert. So I, can, I know that not everyone is as comfortable as I am. And my kids give, I have adult children and they give me a hard time. I get off the airplane and I tell them about whoever was sitting next to me <laughs> or you know, wherever. Yeah. But, but you're professional. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's interesting to me, yeah. you know, and they oh, roll their eyes, mom has a new best friend, <laughs> another new best friend. So I think part of it is your personality. And um, I, do, I think even though if you're more introverted, um, knowing that most people want to be seen and, and that alone and, and we're living in a world where we're invisible. I read about something, uh, an experiment on a train in Long Island recently where they asked people who take this train every day to change it up and stop reading their newspaper and get off their iPhone and talk, just ask the person next to, to you, you know, how's your day going or simple questions like that. And they did it, and they were all amazed. You know, people talked back, they started meeting people, and they wanted to do more of it. So sometimes it's pretty darn simple, you know, not terribly complicated. I think I'm um, overthinking it then, yeah. <laughs> if you could make this a citywide ordinance and say, today is Talk to Your Neighbor Day mm -hmm. in Santa Rosa, mm -hmm. right? What do you think would happen? Um, well, you could ask a really basic question like, tell me about a time in your life when things were going really well. We can't think of any safer question than that. And, you know, everyone would pause and start connecting. And then you could reverse that so the person, so there's an equal status thing going on. And that's a, a, one thing about doing an oral history interview. You know, it's not even, but right. if we spent the next 45 minutes and I would interview you, then, you know, then I'd know more about what you're thinking about. So I think it would be a good thing to do. We've, we've worked with some of the groups in the community and we started a guess who's coming to dinner kind of thing where That's we did right. some of that. <laughs> and I think the Community Baptist Church continued it for a few years and we were working with several community and religious groups. But um, there's, there are ways to do that. And, you know, if the city wants to do that, let's go for it. <laughs> <laughs> and I think a place to start, of course, is at listeningforachange.org. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been talking with Phyllis Rosenfield from Listening for a Change. This has been great. I'm so glad we had a chance to talk. And yeah, I hope you come you. back and we'll yeah. continue the conversation. Yeah, yeah. And I'll do my 45 minute uh, no, well, <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, I'll no, 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 no. <laughs> change it up here. <laughs> anyway, thanks for coming on. We'll talk again. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>